Uh, what motivated your decision to run for office? Um, the, the initial motivation was the, the sort of 18 months or so of the 2016 election, which I thought were a low point in American politics. It was so empty of any real discussion and full of anger and um, malice and character assassination. I thought it was dreadful. And uh, I think our civic dialogue has continued to go downhill. And I, I felt I had to do something to push back against that. And the only thing I could think of to do actually was to become involved in running for office. It seems to be the only venue we have right now to have a, a voice in a public discussion and to try to make it more positive and more constructive and to talk about real stuff. So I, I felt compelled to do it uh, in the hopes that my kids and my grandkids and my students and all the people I know would have a, a better future rather than I think the pretty ugly path that we're walking right now. Cool. Um, Utah is known for its soda shops. Uh, what is your favorite go-to drink? Well, I'm going to disappoint you. I think I must have really simple tastes. I like fizzy water. Just plain old water, plain old, uh, maybe with a little lemon flavor in it or lime flavor and some fizz. That, uh, that works for me. Nice. Awesome. Uh, how well do you think Utah has done in responding to COVID-19 and what do we need to do in the future? I think um, there have been both highs and lows. Not, we haven't done as well as we need to do. Uh, the initial response I thought was pretty good when we didn't really know what was coming at us and how it worked. Um, we had a, a pretty rapid slowdown, shutdown, uh, let's see what's really going to happen here and use good, good uh, guidance to avoid it. Um, there have been ups and downs since then, uh, not all of which are the fault of Utah, of the state of Utah, but I don't think that we have successfully overcome them. The hydroxychloroquine purchase was uh, a low point, an early low point. Uh, the arguing about health versus economy um, was not good. Uh, the, the evolution of the argument to be more about an acceptable balance uh, with sort of health costs seen as coming from both of those was better. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we've had is uh, the, the failure to cleave to good information when elected leaders at various levels are speaking. So there are lots of things you don't know about a new disease or a new epidemic, but there are lots of things we do know. And we have very good general guidance from public health about pandemics. Uh, and we have allowed too much bad information to be released by leaders, which has been really confusing uh, because people were supposed to be able to trust tell us uh, very different things. Uh, so, uh, that are, I'm not criticizing change in what we know and change in the details of guidance. I am criticizing saying things like uh, COVID is a hoax uh, or rural, rural areas don't have to be concerned at all about pandemic diseases or we know COVID is no worse than the flu. It's just the flu. It'll be gone in the spring. We'll have a vaccine tomorrow. Uh, so if you look at actual literature or presentations by people with good medical knowledge of what's going on or good public health knowledge, they, you, you know immediately that those things are false. So we should not be putting false ideas on the table. If we don't know, we should say we don't know and we should let people who do know speak. Cool. What are you doing now and what will you do in the future to combat climate change? Well, it's, this is something I've been interested in and concerned about for a long time, both as a person and as a scientist. Uh, so I was one of the authors of the last National Climate Assessment, which came out about three years ago, I think, uh, the uh, fourth National Climate Assessment. And I was an author of the Southwest chapter, which includes Utah and other states in the Southwestern region. So I've worked to get good information together and available to people to give presentations on it to different public audiences and to try to keep the scientific consensus synthesis of what we know moving along. Uh, here in Utah, 
I'm one of the faculty leaders of the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is a Department of Interior uh, organization that has a, a government side and also has a university partnership side that's charged with a, a similar kind of mission to the National Climate Assessment, but it's more local and it's more focused on getting solutions to people to adapt to changing climate, to understand changing climate. Uh, I'm also a faculty leader of a program here at USU uh, that's an interdisciplinary graduate program in climate adaptation science. And the point of that is to give students training and experience in understanding climate adaptation and how to work with people from all different walks of life to uh, find solutions that work uh, to help us adapt as climate has changed and inevitably will continue to change some. Uh, as a senator, I, I would continue working to keep a good, strong conversation on the reality of climate change, uh, on the necessity of slowing it down and uh, learning to live with the dangerous situation we have created with it. Uh, I'm open to a wide range of solutions to the real problems of decreasing rising levels of uh, greenhouse gases, especially carbon type emissions in the atmosphere, and also uh, adapting to the changed physical environment that is already with us, higher temperatures, um, more extreme patterns of both heat and precipitation, uh, more severe storms. So a lot, a lot of things that affect how we build infrastructure, uh, how we, um, the kind of agriculture that works, everything about our livelihoods. Um, I would uh, work very hard for uh, a just transition from the way of living we have right now and the economy we have not right now, especially in areas of energy and transportation, for a, a just transition that doesn't leave people out and that doesn't force things on people that won't work for them, but that lets us slow down uh, what we've done to the atmosphere and uh, keep, keep this a uh, great place to live uh, that remains suitable for people and that offers us livelihoods and well-being. So we have to change. Uh, I'll talk. Um, changes happen when people talk together and work together, and I would work for both of those. Cool. Uh, approximately 75% of the state consists of public lands. Um, how will you address public land usage? Well, I don't know exactly what you mean by usage. I am, I'm a fan of public lands. They've been long loved and valued by all Americans. So I think public lands in public hands is uh, where we want to be. Uh, a friend of mine uh, once said that uh, public lands are the only lands that most Americans own or ever will own. And I think that will remain true for a long, long time. Uh, there are lands, they're not the government's lands. Uh, the government is a steward of those lands for us. Uh, so I support keeping public lands public. And I think it's one of the things that makes the West such a wonderful place to live. And so forgiving of uh, development, we keep the flavor of the West, even with uh, growing populations and changing land uses. I don't think we want to lose that. And I have never seen a poll of Utahns that doesn't show uh, an overwhelming majority supporting public lands being kept public. Uh, what music, podcasts, or audiobooks have you been listening to recently? Well, um, I like music a lot and I like all kinds of music. I especially like live music. So COVID-19 has taken a toll on my music consumption. Um, my husband plays guitar and cello and pretty much anything with strings. So we still have home music. I have a three-year-old grandson and he likes music. He's sort of into percussion and whistles and flutes. So we've had some very alternative family band kind of things, which have been a lot of fun. Um, I always like Guy Clark a whole lot and John Prine. Um, I love chamber music. I love the Fry Street Quartet and the chamber music programs we have here and in Salt Lake City and Utah. I like vocal harmony. I like sort of folk music Americana. And I'll be glad when we can all be together uh, playing music and listening to music again very soon. Podcasts? Um, I've listened to things like This American Life, Radio Lab, On Being, CBC Ideas um, for years, and I love them all, and I still do listen to them. 
I uh, have started in the last several years listening to a lot of more, uh, I, I guess um, I've been educating myself to step into being involved in public service. So I've listened to things like uh, Power Corrupts and Lawfare uh, and a variety of policy or history or law or government oriented podcasts. And they've, they've been great. Uh, books. Um, I usually only listen to audio books if I'm driving long distances and I haven't done much of that. And I like to hold books in my hands and read them. Uh, again, my, my leisure reading has fallen away in the last four or five months as I've been working hard on learning how one campaigns for office and being prepared to be a good senator. Uh, so I've, I've read a lot of American government history. <laughs> I've read a lot of policy-oriented works. I've read things on poverty, uh, on race in America, on education. I read a really great book called Heartland that I would recommend to anyone. Uh, I think the, the subtitle is Working Hard and um, Being Poor in the Richest Country in the Land. It was written by a woman named Sarah Smarsh, um, who's a journalist who writes a lot about class and rural issues in America. And it's a story of four generations of women in her family who fell into this working hard and not getting ahead, but really doing what were the right things for their family. So I think it's uh, charming and educating. It's a really great book. Awesome. I would definitely agree with, it'll be nice when we have live music again, for sure. <laughs> I'm excited for that. Awesome. Um, how will you represent Utah's large college student population? Uh, well, I would ask you to tell me how you want to be represented, what you need, what issues are most important to you, uh, what things you really want to happen, what things you really don't want to happen. So, I mean, as you know, I've worked with students for a long, long time. So I have some insights into things that matter for younger people. And my kids are younger people, young adults now. So I hear from them what matters to them. But I would I think um, things work best when you get information on people's perspectives directly from them. You don't assume you know what they need or what they want. So I would want to meet with students. I want, would, as I would want to meet with other constituents, to have regular meetings in places that are easy for people to come to at a variety of times so they don't leave people out, and just ask you to tell me what you want. Cool. Uh, what plans do you have to address racial justice and police reform issues? Racial justice is so hard, isn't it? It's so disappointing that 150 years after the Civil War and 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement and Civil Rights Act back in the 60s that we're, we haven't come farther than we have. Um, I guess I'm... I'm among the many who were shocked by some of the things that we saw earlier this summer uh, by um, a cold, callous, calculated, observed um, killing of a person, uh, which was dreadful and uh, seemed to be related to race and poverty. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna step to this, the second issue first because I think we're in a place where we can really make progress rapidly on that and that was police reform. So I don't think that defunding the police, getting rid of the police is the right thing to do. Uh, some people doing bad things uh, in one field doesn't mean everyone in that field does that. That's an unfair overgeneralization, which is the same kind of thing that uh, causes the problems uh, that keep racial bigotry with us, I think. Uh, but there seems to be enormous political will in Utah right now and actually in America to do something to stop uh, the incidences of police violence that we have. Uh, and some of them, what we saw in June in Minneapolis was the worst example of what can happen, the ugliest side imaginable. Um, there also are a lot of shootings that happen because of um, encounters involving mentally ill people or large crowds where people have arms and things like that. Uh, the kinds of suggestions that are on the table, and there are lots of them now, include uh, restricting the role of police more to what police were founded for, which is law enforcement and things that involve um, 
real breakage of the law, not general enforcement of uh, social situations, and uh, that they should not be the point of, of first action when mental illness is involved in the problem. Uh, so there, I read a, a report yesterday or the day before that just came out from Human, Human Rights Watch that synthesizes the general kinds of suggestions that have been put on table for doing that. And they look very similar to me to suggestions I've seen coming out of uh, Salt Lake or um, other places in the US. And I think, I think we have the political will and the good ideas to move on that. Uh, the voices of people from uh, the, the groups that have disproportionately suffered in violent encounters recently, which include uh, different groups of peoples of color, people who are mentally ill or disabled, uh, people who are poor, uh, need to be at the table uh, when those changes are made. And if we have things like community oversight boards, they or experts that have worked on the issues that affect them need to be at the table in those. But I think we can change the problems we have with inappropriate policing and some of the both deliberate and accidental violent things that have come out of the situation we're in now. For, awesome. for racial justice, um, I, would, I would continue to speak for it and about it. I have very strong feelings about that. I grew up in the 1960s. I remember uh, <laughs> School, school desegregation efforts uh, and um, how awful those were for young people trying to go to colleges or go to schools and the violence that surrounded that. Uh, when people were in the streets in the 1960s, when the, the more, um, I guess, disruptive parts of the civil rights movement were, were around, when things were falling apart. People were in the streets in peaceful ways, in genuinely peaceful ways in the 60s, but there also were some riots. Uh, when there, there were not as many white faces in the crowds uh, demonstrating for change then as there are now. I think that there is more awareness and more of our failure to come as far as we need to, and that there is more political determination to make a difference now. So if we continue to talk, if we continue to have uh, voices from all groups in the discussion and uh, continue to decide together how to move it forward, I think we can make progress, real progress on that now also. But it's so disappointing that it takes so long. I, I really, in many ways, cannot understand how we allow the level of um, racial bigotry, as well as disadvantage of some races uh, to be still with us today. And honestly, I'm a biologist. I don't even think race is a real category. It's ethnic groups. It's groups that can be identified by some characteristic. Uh, but we're all people. Awesome. Uh, if you had to condense your platform into a tweet, so I think it's about 280 characters, what would it be? Well, I've done that a bunch of times. I've got a Twitter account, so you can see what I've said before. I think I'm Nancy UT Bennett 25 on Twitter, uh, but you would find it if you looked around. Um, I have said super short things like for strong, healthy communities and governance you can believe in. And I've talked some about listening and learning. Um, and maybe I can read you one. I had one recent one. What have I said? I will work for balanced approaches that port, support strong, healthy communities for abundant and honest civic dialogue and support well-informed planning for growth. I've also had said something about balance. A vote for Nancy is a vote for balance and fairness and justice in Utah government or something of that sort. You run on more than a single thing for a platform. And I like the sh short, short is good, but um, it's also more than a single thing. Cool. Uh, and then this is our last question. Is there anything specific you'd like to say to the student population? Yeah, um, there are two things. One is I sure would like to hear from you. You can call me, you can email me, um, you can set up meetings with me. Um, I think there is a student group that has organ organized an Instagram live town hall for October 6th. I think I have that date right. So um, tune in if you want to ask questions. And uh, 
people my age have gotten us into uh, not such a great social situation right now. And uh, we will, at least some of us, will do our best to walk things in a more positive direction. Uh, politics doesn't have to be ugly, government doesn't have to be corrupt, and we will have a future. And we're, we are in it together. And I fully believe that we can, can and must do better and that we will do better now. Awesome. Thank you again, Nancy, for joining us today. Um, we wish you luck on the election and we'll probably tune into that October 6th uh, town hall too. So thank you again.